Support for this NPR podcast and the following message come from Pearson, partnering with higher education institutions for improved student achievement and college affordability through its digital direct access model. Learn how the model can work for your students at pearson.com direct. Hey, it's Guy here, and I have a question for you. Have you ever seen something so beautiful that you don't even have any words for it? All you can do is let out a deep sigh. And that beauty, it fulfills some kind of innate biological need. Coming up on the show, we ask, are humans hardwired to crave beauty? And how does it affect our lives for better or for worse? This episode is called What is Beauty? And it originally aired in April 2013. This is the TED Radio Hour. Each week, groundbreaking TED Talks. TED Talks. Um, TED. TED. Technology. Entertainment. Design. Design. Is that really what it stands for? <laughs> I've never known that. Delivered at known. TED conferences around the world. It's the gift of the human imagination. We've had to believe in impossible things. The true nature of reality beckons from just beyond. Those talks, those ideas, adapted for radio. From NPR. I'm Guy Raz, and on the show today, beauty. What is it anyway? Well, it, it turns out we may actually need beauty. Like we need oxygen or water, we may need it to survive. There's a story Robert Gupta tells in his TED Talk. Robert's a violinist with the LA Philharmonic. And one day... One day, Los Angeles Times columnist Steve Lopez was walking along the streets of downtown Los Angeles when he heard beautiful music. And the source was a man, an African-American man, charming, rugged, homeless, playing a violin that only had two strings. You may know a bit of this story. There was a, a movie about it called The Soloist. And what happened was that Steve Lopez was like blown away by the music. And so he struck up a conversation with the homeless violinist. His name is Nathaniel Ayers. And eventually, they became friends. Nathaniel was an amazing musician. He'd been trained at Juilliard earlier in his life. And it was a hard life he lived, because Nathaniel also suffers from schizophrenia. And not too long after Steve Lopez came across Nathaniel, Robert Gupta did as well. I met Mr. Ayers in 2008 at Walt Disney Concert Hall. He had just heard a performance of Beethoven's First and Fourth Symphonies and came backstage and introduced himself when speaking in a very jovial and gregarious way about Yo-Yo Ma and Hillary Clinton and how the Dodgers were never going to make the World Series, all because of the treacherous first violin passage work in the last movement of Beethoven's Fourth Symphony. And we got talking about music, and I got an email from Steve a few days later saying that Nathaniel was interested in a violin lesson with me. Now, I should mention that Nathaniel refuses treatment. Because when he was treated, it was with shock therapy and Thorazine and handcuffs, and that scar has stayed with him for his entire life. But as a result, now he is prone to these schizophrenic episodes, wandering the streets of Skid Row, exposed to its horrors, with the torment of his own mind unleashed upon him. And Nathaniel was in such a state of agitation when we started our first lesson at Walt Disney Concert Hall, he had a kind of manic glint in his eyes. He was lost. And he was talking about invisible demons and smoke and how someone was poisoning him in his sleep. And Robert was freaked out. He was afraid that his gifted student would go off the rails and lose himself and lose the moment. And that I would ruin his relationship with the violin if I started talking about scales and arpeggios and other exciting forms of didactic violin pedagogy. <laughs> so I just started playing. And I played the first movement of the Beethoven Violin Concerto. And as I played, there was a profound change occurring in Nathaniel's eyes. It was as if he was in the grip of some invisible pharmaceutical, a chemical reaction for which my playing, the music, was its catalyst. And in a miracle, he lifted his own violin 
and he started playing by ear certain snippets of violin concertos, which he then asked me to complete. Mendelssohn, Tchaikovsky, Sibelius. And through playing music, this man had transformed from the paranoid, disturbed man that had just come from walking the streets of downtown Los Angeles to the charming, erudite, brilliant Juilliard-trained musician. And I understood that this was the very essence of art. This was the very reason why we made music, that we take something that exists within all of us at our very fundamental core, our emotions. And through our artistic lens, through our creativity, we're able to shape those emotions into reality. And the reality of that expression reaches all of us and moves us, inspires and unites us. And for Nathaniel, that was the power of beauty, the, the beauty that he felt in that music. But why was it so powerful, and, and how did he know it was beautiful? Well, this is a big and still unanswerable question for philosophers, including Dennis Dutton, who asked that very question in his TED Talk. Of course, a lot of people think they already know uh, the proper answer to the question, what is beauty? Now, this is an extremely complicated subject, in part because the things that we call beautiful are so different. I mean, just think of the sheer variety. A baby's face, Berlioz's Herald in Italy, a central California landscape. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Movies like The Wizard of Oz or the plays of Chekhov. A Hokusai view of Mount Fuji, Van Gogh's Starry Night. We must be over the rainbow. Der Rosenkavalier. A stunning match-winning goal in a World Cup soccer match. This brief list includes human beings, natural landforms, works of art, and skilled human actions. But why? Why are these things beautiful? Hello? Well, no one knows for sure, but hello? some people have tried to figure it out. I cannot hear you. Hello, hello. Including this guy. Hoy. Hoy they, as we say. Uh, I'm Alexander Malamit, and I'm an artist. I came from Moscow, Russia in 1978 to New York. And uh, back in 1995. Many, many years ago, actually. Alexander Melamed did a kind of, uh, what, a scientific art project? Exactly, yeah, sure. We, I mean, yeah, most people uh, identify beauty with art, that art represents beauty. It's not clear what beauty is, but the, the idea was to understand what people want to see from art itself. Okay, so most people think art is beautiful. And if Alexander could figure out what kind of art they liked, he could probably figure out what kind of art they thought was beautiful and why they thought it was beautiful. So he decided to test this out on 17 uh, countries. The United States, Russia, Ukraine, Denmark, Germany, England. And a few others. And he gave people in each country a series of questions, the same questions everywhere, about what they like when it comes to art. So... Uh, beginning was kind of a, a, a general... Um, general questions, you general, know, like uh, rough surfaces or smooth uh, surfaces. Do you want to see brush strokes or you don't want to see brush strokes? That sort of thing. But then it got a little bit more specific, like what's your favorite color? Do you prefer abstract painting or uh, realistic painting? Do you like famous people from history or famous people who are still alive? Do you like people with clothes on or without them? And the results began to come back. Like in France, they liked uh, half-naked uh, uh, people, you know? Because, Whereas in the U.S., not so much. Americans are more Puritan. I mean, it's obvious, you know. Okay, maybe not that surprising. But some of the other results were, like favorite color. In China in 1995, most people, nearly a quarter, said blue. 
but not just in China. The same exact ratio in Russia. The highest number there also liked blue. Ukraine. Blue. Denmark. Blue. Germany. Blue. England. Italy. Kenya. Blue. 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 I realized that that's that's it. It doesn't really matter, you know. We're all similar, you know. <laughs> and it wasn't just the same color that people found beautiful in each country, but most people also preferred spring. They preferred paintings of outdoor scenes to indoor ones. They preferred paintings of lakes and rivers and forests over cities. Alex got enough information like this to basically construct the ideal artwork, the ideal of beauty according to each country. And it turns out it's a landscape, which takes us back to Dennis Dutton's TED Talk. This landscape shows up today on calendars, on postcards, in the design of golf courses and public parks, and in gold frame pictures that hang in, in living rooms from New York to New Zealand. A landscape that just happens to be similar to the Pleistocene savannas where we evolved. It's a kind of Hudson River School landscape featuring open spaces of low grasses interspersed with copses of trees. The trees, by the way, are often preferred if they fork near the ground. That is to say, if they're trees you could scramble up if you were in a tight fix. The landscape shows the presence of water directly in view or evidence of water in a bluish distance indications of animal or bird life, as well as diverse greenery. And finally, get this, a path, perhaps a river bank or a shoreline, that extends into the distance, almost inviting you to follow it. This landscape type is regarded as beautiful even by people in countries that don't have it. The ideal savanna landscape is one of the clearest examples where human beings everywhere find beauty in similar visual experience. For Alexander Melamed, the guy whose research led to this conclusion, when this picture emerged, this image of a landscape, well, in a way, it was almost disappointing. He wondered why beauty, or at least what we think of it, isn't more complicated. You know, it was, uh, we were saddened first. And then it was fun, you know, and it's, that's what it is. The truth is simple to turn out to be, not as complicated as I wanted it to be. But maybe simple truth is real truth. Sky, a lake, mountains, meadow, and uh, George Washington and mm, hippopotamus. George Washington and a hippopotamus. Because after he had his poll results, Alexander Melamed painted each country's ideal landscape. They were mostly similar, but George Washington and a hippo were two specific additions Alex made to his landscape painting for Americans. Because people that he surveyed in the US said they preferred famous people from history and wild animals. We could put any uh, wild animal, but uh, we wanted to keep some fun in this painting. Uh, so yeah, myself who interpreted it as, as Hippopotamus. And you can find a link to all of Alexander Melamed's paintings at ted.npr.org. I personally like hippopotamuses. I mean, they're cute. More from philosopher Dennis Dutton. That's in a minute. I'm Guy Raz. You're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Hey, everyone, just a quick thanks to two of our sponsors who help make this podcast possible. First, to Amica Insurance. For over 100 years, Amica has built its reputation on exceptional customer service. Today, it's a company people trust for auto, home, and life insurance, a company to recommend to friends and family looking for something different for their insurance needs. Visit meetamica.com slash NPR and discover why 95% of Amica customers with combined auto and home policies stay with them. Thanks also to Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com ideas. Jessica? 
Equal Housing Lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLSConsumerAccess.org number 3030. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. And on our show today, what's beauty and why the survival of our species may depend on it? So we were just listening to Dennis Dutton's TED Talk, and in it, he mentions a particular landscape that people in countries all over the world, almost universally, find beautiful. It's a kind of Hudson River School landscape featuring open spaces, the presence of water directly in view, indications of animal or bird life, as well as diverse greenery. All of these things are signs that this environment can sustain life, so that we need a water source. Flowering plants suggest the future of food, uh, fruit, and honey. So this is Nancy Edkoff. I'm an assistant clinical professor at Harvard Medical School. And Nancy studies the science of beauty. Do we need beauty to live, to survive? Yes, I believe that beauty is a very fast instinctual response. It's a very inspiring response. From our basic motivations to live and survive, to our need for experiences of awe and pleasure, and a sense of aspiration of what might be perfect in the world, beauty draws us in. We can't stop looking or listening or touching or thinking about the beautiful. And it takes us outside of ourselves and it motivates us. And so I believe that beauty is, is essential to, to life and to happiness. Dennis Dutton gave his TED Talk back in 2010. And unfortunately, he died later that year. But we wanted to dig a bit deeper into his talk. So we called Nancy Edkoff. She's also been on the TED stage, and she's very familiar with Dennis Dutton's work. Dennis makes this point in his talk, right, that we like certain kinds of landscapes, and yes. that that's a very primal thing. Is that yes. true? I believe it is. And often people want to be up on a hill because they want to have the prospect, the ability to see far in terms of understanding what resources are, are available, what predators may be out there, what dangers. Except our brains translate that into beauty. Yes. And we don't think about that consciously. So when people buy a house looking out over green and, and lush valley and lakes and rivers, um, they won't think my unconscious mind, my ancestors, would see this as a place where they could prosper and survive and hunt and gather and wouldn't have to move and, and face drought and scarcity. They're thinking, this looks good to me. You know, I can get a lot of money back for a house like this. But, someone might argue, that's natural beauty. How about artistic beauty? So here's Dennis Dutton's take from his TED Talk. Tastes for both natural beauty and for the arts travel across cultures with great ease. Beethoven is adored in Japan. Peruvians love Japanese woodblock prints. Inca sculptures are regarded as treasures in British museums, while Shakespeare is translated into every major language of the earth. Or just think about American jazz or American movies. They go everywhere. How can we explain this universality? The best answer lies in trying to reconstruct a Darwinian evolutionary history of our artistic and aesthetic tastes. We can say that the experience of beauty is one of the ways that evolution has of arousing and sustaining interest or fascination, even obsession, in order to encourage us toward making the most adapted decisions for survival and reproduction. Beauty is nature's way of acting at a distance, so to speak. I mean, you can't expect to eat an adaptively beneficial landscape and would hardly do to eat your baby or your lover. So evolution's trick is to make them beautiful, to have them exert a kind of magnetism to give you the pleasure of simply looking at them. Even ancient tools like those teardrop-shaped axes, those obsidian stones, you know, you see in museums, they may look kind of crude, but at some point, Dennis Dutton says, people started thinking, you know, I should make this beautiful. And 
actually, I have to make this beautiful, as in the survival of our species may depend on it. Hand axes mark an evolutionary advance in human history, tools fashioned to function as what Darwinians call fitness signals. That is to say, displays that are perf performances like the peacock's tail, except that unlike hair and feathers, the hand axes are consciously, cleverly crafted. Competently made hand axes indicated desirable personal qualities. Intelligence, fine motor control, planning ability, conscientiousness, and sometimes access to rare materials. You know, it's an old line, but it has been shown to work. Why don't you come up to my cave so I can show you my hand axes? <laughs> From Lascaux to the Louvre to Carnegie Hall, human beings have a permanent, innate taste for virtuoso displays in the arts. We find beauty in something done well. So the next time you pass by a jewelry shop window displaying a beautifully cut teardrop-shaped stone, don't be so sure it's just your culture telling you that that sparkling jewel is beautiful. Your distant ancestors loved that shape and found beauty in the skill needed to make it. Is beauty in the eye of the beholder? No, it's deep in our minds, it's a gift handed down from the intelligent skills and rich emotional lives of our most ancient ancestors. Our powerful reaction to images, to the expression of emotion in art, to the beauty of music, to the night sky, will be with us and our descendants for as long as the human race exists. Thank you. Dennis Dutton, he passed away in 2010. You can see his whole talk at TED.com. It is truly a beautiful experience with very, very cool graphics. Okay, so beautiful objects and landscapes and stuff. But what about humans? What about the people we find beautiful? Who decides that? Well, this is where Nancy Edkoff comes in. One way is if we have tastemakers. And so a lot of the models that we see are kind of odd looking because as we've had more and more media spread, there's often interest in someone you haven't seen before or a look you haven't seen before. Maybe that isn't the person you would have chosen as the most beautiful, but they've been put forth in the culture that way. So yes, they can kind of jump to the top in beauty. In terms of someone becoming beautiful, you'll see that as people are really liked, respected, and loved particularly, they will appear more beautiful to the people that love them. Hmm. Where if you look at long-term couples, people will tend to rate their mates very highly, far above what perhaps other people might. And so there's some alchemy involved when you love someone where their features become imbued with a lot of emotion for you and are seen as beautiful. But if you look at extreme beauty, it's often an exaggeration. And particularly with women, much less so with men, it's an exaggeration of their femininity. Uh, and so, you know, clear skin and thick lustrous hair, an hourglass shape in, in a young woman. But I mean, that's changed, right? Like what we think of as beautiful, at least in this country or in the West is, is different than what we thought 50, 100, 500 years ago. Yes, and that's part two. People around the world will love clear skin and thick lustrous hair, but the environment around us feeds us ideas about what within that very broad category of attractive to beautiful we are going to focus on right now. And so, for example, throughout evolutionary history, someone as thin as the top models now would look sickly. They would not be attractive. So things do change. Nancy Edkoff. You can see her TED Talk at TED.com. Her latest book is called Survival of the Prettiest. Speaking of which... When I walk into a room, I feel like there's a lot of tension and... You know, some people probably want to have sex with me, and other people are jealous. And other people are judging me because they might know that I'm a model. That's Cameron Russell. High cheekbones, full lips, long legs, a supermodel. 
Here's how she opened her TED Talk. Hi, my name is Cameron Russell. Um, and for the last uh, little while, I've been a model, um, actually for 10 years. <laughs> um, and I feel like there's an uncomfortable tension in the room right now because I should not have worn this dress. Describe what you're wearing. So, I was wearing an incredibly tight black dress that's basically made out of the same stuff we make tights out of, and it's really short. Luckily, I brought an outfit change. This is the first outfit change on the TED stage, so you guys are pretty lucky to witness it, I think. Were you nervous? Um, oh my god, I was totally nervous. Could you tell? <laughs> that was awkward. Well... <laughs> I thought it would be an interesting way to open a talk about image to put on an incredibly sexy dress and have the audience make a judgment about who I was, and then to switch into my nerdy academic outfit. So why did I do that? I just totally transformed what you thought of me in six seconds. And of course, barring surgery, there's very little that we can do to transform how we look. And how we look, though it is superficial and immutable, has a huge impact on our lives. Like, like when? It happens to me all the time. Actually, just two weeks ago, I was driving with my boyfriend on Houston. I forget how it started, but we got pulled over, and he definitely seemed like he was going to give us a ticket for something when he was talking to my boyfriend. And then I leaned forward from the passenger seat, and I said, Oh, hi, officer. I'm so sorry I don't have my seatbelt. I was eating this little lemon square. And he goes, Oh, that looks delicious. I said, yeah, it, it is delicious. It's great. And he was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry. Just put your seatbelt on and keep on going. I had that experience often. And I am on this stage because I am a model. I'm on this stage because I am a pretty white woman. In my industry, we call that a sexy girl. Um, and I'm going to answer the questions that people always ask me, but with an honest twist. So the first question is, how do you become a model? Um, and I always just say, oh, I was scouted, but that means nothing. Um, the real way that I became a model is I won a genetic lottery, and I am the recipient of a legacy. And maybe you're wondering, what is a legacy? Well, for the past few centuries, we have defined beauty not just as health and youth and symmetry that we're biologically programmed to admire, but also as tall, slender figures and femininity, and white skin. And this is a legacy that was built for me, and it's a legacy that I've been cashing out on. And how has she been cashing out on it? Well, Cameron graduated from Columbia University last June. Now, there's a lot she could do, things that would have nothing to do with her looks, and yet... I have been offered so many, too many um, opportunities. I'm offered TV shows and movies and books, and that's all just because of how I look. You know, I'm making two different statements. You know, in a larger societal way, I'd, I think it's unfortunate that we value and reward people who look like me. But on a personal note, of course, I'm incredibly lucky. You almost talk about yourself like you're not really, it's just something else, that you kind of step outside of it, and you're sort of observing yourself in that world that you inhabit. Well, certainly how I look is going to change in the next 10 years. So I don't give it huge importance. You know, I'm paid a ton of money for having a 23-inch waist. But of course, that's not a value to me. That's not a long-term career. I will demonstrate for you now 10 years of accumulated model knowledge. Because unlike cardiothoracic surgeons, it can just be distilled right into right now. So... If the photographer is right there, and the light is right there, like a nice HMI, and the client says, Cameron, we want a walking shot. Well, then this light goes first, nice and long. This arm goes back, this arm goes forward, the head is at three quarters, and you just go back and forth. Just do that. And then you look back at your imaginary friends, 300, 400, 500 times. <laughs> Unfortunately, after you've gone to school and you have a resume and you've done a few jobs, you can't say anything anymore. So if you say you want to be the president of the United States, but your resume reads underwear model 10 years, people give you a funny look. The next question people always ask me is, do they retouch all the photos? And yeah, they pretty much retouch all the photos, but that is only a small component of what's happening. 
These pictures are not pictures of me, they are constructions. And they are constructions by professionals, by hairstylists and makeup artists and photographers and stylists and all of their assistants and pre-production and post-production. And they build this, that's not me. Um, when I was researching this talk, I found out that of the 13-year-old girls in the United States, 53% don't like their bodies. And that number goes to 78% by the time that they're 17. Do you have a problem with it? With being a misconstrued in those images? No. Do you have a problem with this idea of, of manufacturing a kind of a look, of essentially reinforcing these notions of what beauty is? Well, I don't have a problem with the sort of constructed factor. I think that the artists that work on those pictures are incredibly talented. I think the problem that I have with those images is just that they're very exclusive. There's a little bit more diversity in more mass markets. So if you go into Target, for example, you'll probably see girls that are non-white, girls that are a little bit heavier than you will in French Vogue. But uh, if there's a solution to that or if there's something that the fashion world can do, and maybe this goes for everyone in the world, is just to assume a piece of the blame. And I'm happy to talk about, you know, being not sure that I should do every single shoot. And I am very thoughtful about whether or not I should work for certain clients or produce certain images. And I worry that um, I'm really a staple now of that industry, which promotes skinny white women as what's beautiful. And I think it's okay to say that. I think we don't live in a retouched world. We can just say, I'm not sure that I made the right decision every time. I am a little bit guilty for what's going on. So the last question people ask me is, you know, what is it like to be a model? And I think the answer that they're looking for is if you are a little bit skinnier and you have shinier hair, you will be so happy and fabulous. And when we're backstage, we give an answer that maybe makes it seem like that. We say it's really amazing to travel and it's amazing to get to work with creative, inspired, passionate people. And those things are true, but they're only one half of the story because the thing that we never say on camera, that I have never said on camera, is I am insecure. And I'm insecure because I have to think about what I look like every day. And if you ever are wondering, you know, if I have thinner thighs and shinier hair, will I be happier? Um, you just need to meet a group of models because they have the thinnest thighs and the shiniest hair and the coolest clothes, and they're the most physically insecure women probably on the planet. So when I was writing this talk, I found it very difficult to strike an honest balance because on the one hand, I felt very uncomfortable to come out here and say, look, I've received all these benefits from a deck stacked in my favor. And it also felt really uncomfortable to follow that up with, and it doesn't always make me happy. Um, if there's a takeaway to this talk, I hope it's that we all feel more comfortable acknowledging the power of image in our perceived successes and our perceived failures. Thank you. Cameron Russell. She gave that talk last year at TED Mid-Atlantic here in Washington, D.C. You can find that talk at TED.com. We're talking about beauty today, who decides and why our very survival may depend on experiencing it. Coming up, the most beautiful plastic bag you have ever seen. I'm Guy Raz. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Hey, everyone, just a quick thanks to two of our sponsors who help make this podcast possible. First, to GoToWebinar, the webinar platform that's hosted 2.3 million interactive web events with over 60 million views per year. GoToWebinar believes webinars are one of the best ways to interact with your prospects and customers instead of business presentations or company websites. Turn your next presentation into a conversation with GoToWebinar. For more information, visit GoToWebinar.com. Dot com slash podcast. Support also comes from TIAA. In the past three years, TIAA has shared $10 billion in profits, not with shareholders, but with participants, TIAA retirement plan customers. And for years, it's provided personalized financial advice at no extra cost, regardless of the size of their accounts. TIAA gives back to participants so participants can give back to the world. Learn more at TIAA.org.
It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. Hey, folks. On the show today, beauty and how beauty actually changed Bill Strickland's life and the lives of the people around him. It's 10 o'clock here, and there's arts kids coming in the front door. Bill's in Pittsburgh, and this is his tour. We're passing photographs of Dr. King. There's no easy way to describe the place, but it's basically a vocational center called Manchester Bidwell. And it's in a rough part of Pittsburgh, where the word beauty, not usually the way people describe the neighborhood, except that beauty is the guiding principle behind everything inside Manchester Bidwell. The building is very hopeful and it's very bright, even on a gray day, because we believe that the philosophy of being positive and being hopeful and literally being in the light is part of the strategy to recover people who have had some challenges in life. There's a big kitchen where a student chef named Malcolm Jarrett has just made... A chickpea puree, you know, a sautéed spinach with a nice filet uh, with a demi-gloss, a thyme wine reduction demi-gloss on top. So to me that was a beautiful plate that could be as beautiful as like a mango or Renoir, or anything like that. It's your art that you contribute to the world. And on the second floor, well, that's where Bill Strickland's favorite spot in the whole place is. So we are literally now walking into the recording studio. Probably can hear some music, like, right now. I visualized when I was in high school that someday I'd have the hippest, coolest jazz recording studio in the world. And I'd be standing there doing exactly what I'm doing today. So this is very cool for me too, man. It's um, a great honor to be here with you. When Bill Strickland spoke on the TED stage, Herbie Hancock, the jazz musician, sat behind him. Both men were improvising, Herbie on the piano, Bill telling the story of how he built his center, a place where all kinds of art, jazz and ceramics and photography and food, all come together in one of the worst parts of town. The whole story really starts with me as a high school kid uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in a tough neighborhood that everybody gave up on for dead. And on a Wednesday afternoon, I was walking down the corridor of my high school, kind of minding my own business. And there was this artist, teacher, who made a great big old ceramic vessel and I happen to be looking in the door of the art room, and if you've ever seen clay done, it's magic. And I had never seen anything like that before in my life. So I walked into the art room, and I said, what is that? And he said, ceramics, and who are you? And I said, I'm Bill Strickland, and I want you to teach me that. And he said, well, get your homeroom teacher to sign a piece of paper that says you can come here, and I'll teach it to you. And so for the remaining two years of my high school, I cut all my classes. But I had the presence of mind to give the teachers classes that I cut, the pottery that I made. (laughs) And they gave me passing grades, and that's how I got out of high school. And when he got out of college, Bill raised the money to build his art center in that part of town. We have quilts and clay and calligraphy, and everywhere your eye turns, there's something beautiful looking back at you. That's deliberate. That's intentional. We even have flowers in the hallway, and they're not plastic, those are real. And now that I'm giving lots of speeches, we had a bunch of high school principals come and see me, and they said, Mr. Strickland, what an extraordinary story, and what a great school. And we were particularly touched by the flowers, and we were curious as to how the flowers got there. I said, well, I got in my car, and I went out to the greenhouse, and I bought them, and I brought them back, and I put them there. You don't need a task force or a study group to buy flowers for your kids. Literally, students walk in the front door on any given day, and there's an orchid that greets them at the front desk, which is the first thing that they see when they walk in the place. And I believe in introducing those magical moments on a work day, not just on a weekend, but on Monday morning. You couldn't look at an orchid and, and not see it as a beautiful thing. No. And... Now that many of our students who have never been in touch with orchids or seen them before, it is now becoming a part of their vocabulary. They're assuming that the world is made up of pretty things like orchids, and they're absolutely right. And the world that they're going to enter into, they're going to be seeing a lot of orchids. They, in some ways, become an orchid. 
I have 400 kids from the Pittsburgh public school system that come to me every day of the week for arts education, and these are children who are flunking out of public school. And last year, I put 88% of those kids in college, and I've averaged over 80% for 15 years. We've made a fascinating discovery. There's nothing wrong with the kids. For that, I won a big old plaque, Man of the Year in Education. I beat out all the PhDs because I figured that if you treat children like human beings, it increases the likelihood they're going to behave that way. So, I mean, for you, and I guess really for all of us, I mean, beauty isn't just this thing, this concept. I mean, it's, it has a, this transformative power. When I think of beauty, I think of life and hope and all of its enormous possibilities. So that this beauty is not just for the imagination. It actually is a way of altering human behavior for the better. And so this is a real practical example, a living example, of how beauty and aesthetic can transform a community that had literally been, in some ways, been given up on for dead. When Bill Strickland gave his TED Talk back in 2002, he described a time when all kinds of people, politicians and philanthropists and artists, they'd come up to him and they'd ask, how could we go back to our cities, you know, and build something just like this? But I met a guy uh, named Quincy Jones along the way. And Quincy said, I want to help you, man. Let's do one in L.A. And Quincy said, where did the idea for centers like this come from? And I said, it came from your music, man. Because Mr. Ross used to bring in your albums when I was 16 years old in the pottery class when the world was all dark. And I said, if I can follow that music, I'll get out into the sunlight and I'll be okay. And if that's not true, how'd I get here? That's Bill Strickland. Since he gave his TED Talk, replicas of his art center have been built in San Francisco, Cleveland, Cincinnati, New Haven, and Grand Rapids. So if something beautiful can actually change you, what's going on, I mean, inside of us? Well, that's what Richard Seymour is really curious about. My name's Richard Seymour. I'm a product designer. And his company designs consumer products, bikes and tea kettles and cans of deodorant, the kinds of things that have to catch your eye to to make you say, I need this. Can you, I mean, would you be able to, like, articulate what beauty is to you? I can tell you what beauty is to me. It is a particular series of sensations. And I can feel it in myself because as a designer, I need to do that. Now, that may be different from other people, uh, but I'm sort of tuned in a particular way to pick things up as feelings and then try and reinterpret them and express them through my work. What does it feel like? It can feel poignant. It can feel liberating and exciting. It can feel elevating. There's lots of different ways of it. Here's one way Richard feels it, or felt it once, when he was little. My father told me a story about an 18th century watchmaker. And what this guy had done, he used to produce these fabulously beautiful watches, and one day one of his customers came in to his workshop and asked him to clean the watch that he'd bought. And the guy took it apart, and one of the things he pulled out was one of the balance wheels. And as he did so, his customer noticed that on the back side of the balance wheel was engraving, were words. And he said to the guy, why have you put stuff on the back that no one will ever see? And the watchmaker turned around and said, God can see it. Now, I am not in the least bit religious, neither was my father. But at that point, I noticed something happening here. I felt something in this plexus of blood vessels and nerves, and there must be some muscles in there as well, somewhere, I guess. But I felt something, and it was a physiological response. And from that point on, from my, I was eight at the time, I began to think of things in a different way. I began to ask myself the simple question is, do we actually think beauty? or do we feel it? I think it's about feeling beauty. A lot of the brain is set aside not for thinking. 
you know, a lot of the brain is set aside for processing sensory input. And so it's hardly surprising that we feel it before we think it because the wiring between our sensory uh, apparatus into our brain is actually shorter than the more convoluted wiring that goes through our cognitive centers. So that means that the information arrives earlier and there are parts of our brain that deal with that and determine whether they're pleasurable or not. How do we know how to identify it? Uh, well, it's an interesting <laughs> question. One can go to quite sophisticated levels with brain scanning or what have you to see the electrical activity. But the most important thing is that we know it when we feel it. You know, we, you don't go, that is beautiful in your mind. You go, mmm, and then, mmm, that is beautiful. <laughs> so we should trust our senses. We should trust our feelings more. Well, you remember the first time you got a reasonably expensive cassette deck and the door, instead of springing open in a nasty plasticky way when you press the button, it opened with a cybernetic sigh. Oh, I remember that. Mm. Now, how did that make you feel? It made you feel good. It's what it makes you feel. Same thing, by the way, goes for, say, a car. If you think about an automobile, what are you touching? The steering wheel, the pedals, and maybe the gear shifter, especially if you're in Europe. Well, that's an opportunity to produce a, a beautiful handshake to the object every time you use it. And this is where a lot of people in industry don't seem to get it. They say, oh, that's an area we could cut cost on. You say, look, are you crazy? This is the handshake of the object. This is where you touch it. This is where it should be at its most profoundly delicious. Do you remember when lights used to just go on and off, click, click, when you close the door in a car? And then somebody, I think it was BMW, introduced a light that went out slowly. <laughs> remember that? I remember it clearly. Do you remember the first time you got in the car and it did that? I remember sitting there thinking, this is fantastic. In fact, I've never found anybody that doesn't like the light that goes out slowly. And I thought, well, what the hell is that about? So I started to ask myself questions about it. And the first was, I'd ask other people, do you like it? Yes. Why? And they'd say, oh, it feels so natural or, you know, it's nice. I thought, well, that's not good enough. Can we cut down a little bit further? Because as a designer, I need, to, I need the vocabulary. I need the keyboard of how this actually works. And so I did some experiments. And I suddenly realized that there was something that did exactly that. Light to dark in six seconds. Exactly that. Do you know what it is? Anybody? That thing, the cinema or the theater, it's actually just happened here. Light to dark in six seconds. And when that happens, you're sitting there going, no, the movie's about to start. Or you're going, that's fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. Do I get a sense of anticipation? Now, I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't know even if there is something called a conditioned reflex, but it might be, because the people I speak to in the Northern Hemisphere that used to go into the cinema get this, and some of the people I speak to that have never seen a movie or been to a theatre don't get it in the same way. Everybody likes it, but some like it more than others. During his TED Talk, Richard Seymour flashed a, a picture, a photograph on the screen that looks, well, it's hard to tell. This is one of the most beautiful things I know. It's a plastic bag, and when I looked at it first, I thought, no, there's no beauty in that. Then I found out that this plastic bag, if I put it into a filthy puddle or a stream filled with coliforms and all sorts of disgusting stuff, that that filthy water will migrate through the walls of the bag by osmosis and end up inside it as pure, potable drinking water, and all of a sudden, this plastic bag was extremely beautiful to me. This plastic bag, as we call it, dropped in a dirty puddle in Africa. Within an hour or so, it can deliver the you know, pure drinking water. Now, that is a beautiful thought to me. It generates similar sensations in my body that other forms of beauty would, because it's so right and it's so good. You said in your talk, in your TED Talk, that um, we don't always understand what's beautiful until we know the story behind it, the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And you show this photograph. Look at that. <clears throat> what are you feeling about it? The picture I'm talking about is clearly a naive picture by that it's drawn with a crayon and it is of a butterfly taking off from a flower. Is it beautiful? Is it exciting? I'm watching your faces very carefully. There's some rather bored-looking gentlemen and some slightly engaged-looking ladies. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you what it is. Are you ready? This is the last act on this earth of a little girl called Heidi, five years old, before she died of cancer of the spine. 
It's the last thing she did, the last physical act. Look at that picture. Look at the innocence, look at the beauty in it. Is it beautiful now? Stop, stop. How do you feel? Where are you feeling this? And I'm watching your faces because your faces are telling me something. There's a lady over there who's actually crying, by the way, but what are you doing? I like to look at people's faces when they're reacting to things. When someone's reacting to something that they often think is exquisitely beautiful, their face isn't doing what you think it would do. You'd think, wow, they'd be sort of loving this, so there'd be a big smile on their face. But it's not like that. You've usually got steepled brows and more something that looks like pain than that looks like beauty. I think it's the bittersweetness, the tension between the sweetness and the bitterness that often creates this heightened sense of beauty in something. Do you think we need it, like, in the way we need love or, or food? I believe that we need beauty to at the most astounding level. I think if we deprive ourselves of the appreciation and the contact with beauty, that it diminishes our existence quite considerably. And that's what makes me suspicious about it. Is it just an emotional piece of icing on a cake, or does it have a fundamental reason for existing within Homo sapiens. Is it really there to just make us feel good or is it there to actually help us navigate and understand our lives? Richard Seymour, he's a partner in Seymour Powell. It's a design company based in London. He spoke at TED in London in 2011. Richard, thanks so much. Wonderful, thank you. It's been a pleasure. In fact, it's been beautiful. Thanks for listening to the show this week. If you missed any of it, or if you want to hear more, or you want to find out more about who was on it, you can visit ted.npr.org. You can also find many more TED Talks at ted.com, and you can download the program through iTunes or the NPR smartphone app. Our program was produced by Jeff Rogers, Brent Bachman, Megan Kane, Neva Grant, and Sanaz Meshkanpur, with help from Portia Roberts and Migas and Eric Newsom. Thanks to our partners at TED, Chris Anderson, June Cohen, Darren Triff, and Janet Lee. I'm Guy Raz. You've been listening to Ideas Worth Spreading on the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Stacey Vanek Smith. I'm Cardiff Garcia. And we are here with a new show The Indicator from Planet Money. On every show, we take some number in the news and we dive into it to find the big idea behind it. Get it on NPR One or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>